All right, we are ready to go. So, um, going to be talking about Vim today. I've had a couple questions about this since I used this editor. Um, I hope I noticed it in my lectures. Um, and so I get questions about like, oh, why do you use Vim? And what's that like? And um, uh, you'll, you'll find a lot of people on the internet and probably in real life that are extremely passionate about their editor, whatever it is. Um, Vim tends to have users that are extremely, extremely passionate about their editor and get into very active debates about why it's better than everything else. Um, I'm not really that religious about it. I've just been using it for a long time. Um, I like it. There are a lot of other really good editors out there. So this is not gonna be a talk about um, why this is the best thing and you should all be using Vim. Um, but I, I am gonna talk a little bit about um, uh, it's just going to be kind of an intro to Vim for people who are curious um, and hopefully make it a little less scary because I do think it's a really good editor. Um, and I'm also going to talk just generally about like the reasons that I like it and um, the things that you should be looking for in your editor or expecting from your editor. So there are a lot of different editors out there. Some are better than others. And hopefully this will give you an idea of some of the features that uh, an editor can have. Um, and I think it's good to see that kind of thing because it gives you uh, something to look for when you're deciding like, well, what editor should I use? Um, I always find it interesting to watch other people use editors that I haven't used before because they'll, they'll do things that like, oh, I didn't, my editor can't do that, but that looks really awesome. Maybe I should try your editor and um, uh, it can lead you to finding better tools or to finding features in your own editor that you didn't know were there. Um, as happens a lot of times, I'll see somebody do something in another editor and be like, oh, that's really cool. Why can't my editor do that? And then a lot of times the answer is, well, your editor can do that. You just never knew. Um, so that may be the case for some of this stuff for you as well. Um, so let's jump in. Uh, so why Vim? Uh, this is obviously a question I get a lot. Um, Seems like in the JavaScript circles, Vim is not as popular um, in other communities. It's, it's, it's kind of ascendant. I was sort of an outlier for a while uh, writing in Vim and then I got into the Ruby community and started getting more involved in that and noticing that like, wow, a lot of people are using terminal-based editors. Um, so, um, but um, I think that a bigger question is more um, why not? So there are, uh, Vim has a, a bit of a stigma about it. It's just, it's a little bit different. Um, it's sort of categorically different. It's in a different category than a lot of the other editors out there. A lot of editors like Atom and Sublime Text and um, uh, Visual Studio, a lot of the things that are out there kind of fall in the same bucket. They do things a little bit differently, some better than others. And then Vim is sort of this like other thing that's like this terminal based editor that's kind of confusing to use and nobody can figure out how to get out of it. And, um, and so uh, I think there are a couple of things that keep people from, from trying Vim and make it seem more scary than it uh, needs to be. And one of those is just fear of the terminal in general, especially when you're new to programming um, or new to a terminal environment even. Uh, the thought of having an editor that lives entirely in the terminal is, is scary. Um, that's certainly the case for me when I started. And this sort of boils down to something along the lines of, well, it's just easier to use a program that has a graphical user interface, right? Like we're familiar with mice and pictures and menus that we can like drill down in and click buttons and move sliders around. And it's just, we're, um, there's this sense that like, oh, it's just easier to use programs that have a graphical user interface, which is kind of another way of saying that uh, it's hard to tell a computer to do things just by typing, right? Like it's just easier to use a mouse to tell a computer to do things. And my response to this question for people who are learning programming um, is usually this definition of programming, which is telling a computer to do things just by typing. Uh, it can be intimidating at first, just like programming can, but if, um, if you're setting out on a path to make this your primary skill, programming, 
then telling a computer to do things just by typing should actually end up being a really intuitive way for you to interact with a computer. Um, it's kind of what programming is. Uh, and there's a reason that most programming is still done by typing words and not drawing pictures with your mouse or like clicking on a lot of menus. Um, you know, computer programs are expressed in code, which is text, which ultimately is, you know, typed characters. And uh, there's a reason for that. And that's that these typed characters, these like telling a computer what to do with just by typing words is an incredibly powerful way to express ideas. So if you have an idea like what's the first word alphabetically uh, in a book, say, that starts with T. If I have the whole text of that book in a string variable in JavaScript, I can do something like the lowest T word equals book, split on spaces, filter for words that start with T, then sort them alphabetically, then get the first one. Um, and this is a really like, it's a, it's a brief way to very specifically express this complicated idea of find me the, all of the words in this book that start with the letter T and they get me the first one alphabetically. Um, and you can imagine if you were trying to like build this just by using a mouse, the, the graphical user interface you would have to have to support this level of like detail would be pretty massive, right? Like you'd have to find all of these like split and filter and sort methods in some menu somewhere and select them and then like fill out forms to specify what arguments there would be. And then you'd have to be able to like call other functions on those arguments by like, I don't know, drilling into more menus. Um, the, the GUI that would support this would be incredibly complex. Um, whereas this I can just sort of type out. And once you get used to uh, programming language, most of this stuff you can just remember, right? You can remember that there's a split method, there's a filter method and how that works. Um, so it ends up being a lot faster. It requires you to have a little bit more knowledge in your head. So there is a little bit of a learning curve, right? You can't just explore as much. You have to like dig through documentation. Um, but um, once you get past that initial learning curve, this is a much more efficient way to, to express this idea to a computer, which is why programs are written this way. And so uh, when we think about the terminal, the terminal commands, the commands you're in the terminal are just code. It's just a different language, right? In JavaScript, you would say console.log hello world. In the terminal, you would just say echo hello world. Um, and you can think of all of the programs you can run in the terminal or the commands you can run in a terminal as functions uh, and their arguments you can think of as parameters to a function. So when we say ls dash l slash users slash Trevor, um, we're basically calling a function that might look like this in JavaScript, right? ls with some parentheses and you're passing those two arguments. And similarly, when we're doing like piping results from one command to another, right? We can do a ps aux, which is gonna list all the running processes on our computer. And we can pipe that into a grep command to search for processes with node in the name. Uh, and in JavaScript, that might like, look like something like this, where we you know, call a ps function and pass it this aux parameter and then get the result and then pass that into grep along with this string to search for. And one of the things you might notice about these two examples is that these things on the left here are actually a little cleaner to read than this JavaScript on the right, um, which sort of calls out that the terminal um, script, sort of the language we use in the terminal is intended, it's sort of, it's, it's a little bit specialized, right? It's harder to do certain things writing a script in just like bash. Um, but for these like one line commands, especially where we're taking output of something and then uh, doing something else with it with another command, it's actually really specialized for that. Um, and makes it even kind of cleaner to type this than we would be doing in, if we were like calling functions, right? All the parentheses go away and it's, it's a little easier to type um, in real time. So, um, so if we shouldn't be scared of Vim because it like lives in the terminal, right? Like if we're gonna be programmers, the terminal will actually more and more become a very familiar environment that we find a lot of power in. Um, but that doesn't solve all the problems with Vim. And the, the second reason that I think uh, people get scared away from Vim or other terminal-based editors like Emacs right away, um, well, actually, this is more specific to Vim, right, is this modal editing thing. Um, and uh, most of the time when people hit this barrier, they don't know that they're hitting a barrier with modal editing. 
they're just having this like WTF moment where they got into Vim and uh, everything just went south and got weird in a hurry. So um, a lot of times what that would look like is somehow they think, oh, I need to edit a file. I'll use this VI thing. I've heard that's cool. Um, so they somehow get into a file in Vim and they see this and they think, okay, and this has probably happened. If you've played with Vim at all, this has probably happened to you. It certainly happened to me. Um, let me just make sure that I'm doing this right. There we go. Um, and I'm going to turn on this thing that'll show you the keys that I'm typing. Hopefully that will work. Um, so you come in here and you want to type the, you know, you want to add hello world to this file, right? So you start typing H E L L O space W O R L D. And then you look at what happened and you don't have hello world in your file. You have this blank line and then a space and then just the last part of what you typed. Um, and so suddenly you realize that you're in some sort of like crazy town and Vim is not what you thought it was. Um, and it's time to escape. It's like, well, let's just try something else. And the next thing you're going to hit is like, okay, how do I get out of this program? Well, I'll just control C because I know in a terminal control C will kill the current program. Right. But it turns out control C, uh, doesn't actually do that in Vim, uh, which is infuriating. So then you might try something like, well, what if I just, if I just type quit, you know, will that, will that work? And that doesn't work either and further corrupts the file, but not just by adding quit to it. And now we've got this thing down here telling us that we're recording at you. Who knows what that means? Escape doesn't seem to do anything either. Um, uh, so it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a mess, right? <laughs> like, and you're just stuck in Vim for the rest of your life. And usually what you end up having to do is just close the tab. Um, and, uh, so this may be a common experience for, for many of you. And the, the barrier that you're hitting there is this idea that when, when VI starts, um, it is not by default waiting for you to type things to add into the file. Uh, and that's because of this idea of modal editing. Let me see if I can get back to the directory I want to be in real quick. Here we go. Um, so what is modal editing? Um, uh, modal editing is the thing that uh, spawns all of these numerous memes on the internet about uh, just how awful it is to try and get out of them <laughs> if you accidentally get into it. Um, but um, uh, the reason that you hit those issues is that Vim is a, is a modal editor. Um, and when Vim starts, it's in something called normal mode. And in normal mode, all the keys on the keyboard are used to issue commands to the editor, not to add text into the editor. Um, so where most editors are just sort of like, the keys do what they do kind of all the time. In Vim, what the keys on your keyboard do is contextual. Um, and you can sort of toggle your editor from one mode or another to, to switch the behavior of the keys. Um, and the, the reasoning behind this is, um, is that, you know, in a, in a terminal, you don't have the mouse, right? You don't have menus and things you can click through. So you're relying on keyboard shortcuts to do a lot of those types of things. Um, which is really nice. You don't have to keep moving your hand over to the mouse. You can keep your hands on the keyboard. It ends up making things faster. Um, but with a heavy reliance on keyboard shortcuts, it can be really awkward to start having, always having to type like control, option, T, F, Z. Um, you're going to sprain your pinky a bit trying to like always reach down there for the control key or the command key to like um, find the right keyboard shortcut, right? And so what VI does, it says, okay, by default, we're just going to be in normal mode where every key on the keyboard is a keyboard shortcut for something. Um, and um, then if you want to actually like add text to the file, you move into insert mode implicitly where, explicitly, sorry, where the keys are used to insert actual characters. And then when you're done actually adding characters to the file, you go back to normal mode, uh, which you might also call per here called command mode, uh, where your keys actually uh, execute commands again. Um, and then there's also this visual mode, which we'll look at in a little bit. There's probably four modes in VI technically, but those the main two that you'll interact with are normal mode and insert mode. Um, so let's look at that a little bit. I'm gonna 
open up an example file here. So I've got some example uh, JavaScript code. And so we, we start on the file, we're in normal mode. Uh, so the keys on the keyboard will not add stuff to the file. Uh, they will do other things. They will send commands to the editor to do other things. Um, so the first thing is moving around, right? Um, I can actually use the arrow keys to move around like a normal sane editor will let me do. Um, it turns out um, uh, the letters in the keyboard will also help me move around as well. So if I want to move a word at a time, if I hit W, my cursor will jump to the beginning of the next word. Um, and if I hit B, my cursor will move back to the beginning of um, uh, the current or previous word. So it'll go back to the, uh, it'll go backwards to the beginning of the, like the, the first beginning of a word behind me. It's a terrible way to say that, but you can kind of see it this way, right? So if I've got, um, let me try this one, two, three, four, four. So B moves me backwards to, you know, moves me backwards, stopping at each beginning of a word, and W moves me forward, stopping at each beginning of the word. Um, um, so there's a lot of sort of movement keys like that that will help me uh, move around. Um, I'll just clean that up real quick. Um, so the keys in your keyboard by default, even though I'm typing letters, they're actually doing other things in the editor. They're moving things around for me. If I want to actually um, type some code, if I want to actually put characters in this file, then I type I which changes me into insert mode. And you'll see down on the bottom, this insert word will pop up at the bottom of the editor, letting me know that I'm in insert mode. And from here, VI will work um, just like uh, another editor, right? I can type things in here and hit enter, and I can use the arrows to move around. Um, and it'll work just like every other editor while you're in insert mode. And then when you're done adding things, you hit escape, and you'll see I hit escape and um, I got out of insert mode. That little thing goes away down there at the bottom. So normal mode and insert mode. Um, it's, it's confusing just because it's unexpected, uh, I think is the biggest thing of it. Once you sort of know that's happening, um, it actually gets a lot, uh, it's, it's not that difficult to work with. And there's actually some really powerful benefits of it. Um, but it definitely will trip you up because it's unexpected. It's just different how, than how most editors work, right? Most editors are using all the keys on the keyboard to just insert characters into the file all the time. Um, and then, you know, a handful of the characters, like anything preceded by a command or a control, will be used for keyboard shortcuts. And then you just have to use your mouse to do a lot of other things. Um, so other things that I can do in normal mode is, um, uh, delete things. So it turns out that X in normal mode is like a delete character. It'll just delete the character under my cursor. Um, what gets powerful in normal mode is when you start putting together um, uh, actions and movement <laughs> commands. So we saw that um, uh, w, right, moves me to the beginning of a word and B moves me back to a word. If I type DW for delete word, it will, it will delete everything between my cursor and the beginning of the next word. Um, so I can do that several times and delete these words. Um, and uh, this will be useful, so I'll introduce it now. U, if you type U, U is your undo command. So instead of uh, Command Z, you will undo things that you've done. So I can get all these, uh, all these things back here. Um, so DW will delete to the next word. Um, and so you can kind of see this like starting to act like a programming language, right? Where you have like these different commands that you can string together. W is kind of uh, specifies some direction, some length of movement. And then you can proceed that with D to delete that. Uh, to delete a word. Um, so similarly, uh, a dollar sign will move me to the end of a line and a zero will move me back to the beginning of a line. 
And so if I type D dollar sign, it'll delete everything to the end of the line. Um, so that uh, once you've learned a handful of commands that sort of will move you around from one place to another, then you can combine them with D and now you can delete uh, different blocks of text just by typing two or three characters without having to like use your mouse to select a big area, um, which will speed things up. Uh, the other nice thing about uh, deleting is whenever you delete something in Vim, uh, so let's try this again, let's delete uh, D dollar sign, which deletes that whole line to the end of the line, it automatically puts it in your paste buffer. And then you can use P to paste. Um, so I can, now that I've deleted that thing, I can paste it in here several times. Um, uh, I'll do that last one. So, um, uh, if you want to copy, so D is sort of like cut in that sense, right? Like it deletes the thing from your screen and puts it in your paste buffer. If you want to copy something without deleting it, um, uh, in, in Vim, you use Y. Uh, and the, the mnemonic for that is yank, right? So um, yanking is copying in VI. And we already know that uh, DW, right, will delete uh, a word. And so YW, it makes sense, will yank uh, a single word, right? So I didn't delete anything, but now if I paste, I see that I just have type in my buffer. Um, and all these commands, so DW, YW, can proceed, be preceded with, um, uh, you can add numbers into the command to specify, uh, to sort of modify that movement, right? So we're using W to say we wanna um, uh, delete a word, right? But I can also say uh, D3W, I want to delete three words. Ooh, doesn't work unless I type it right. D3W. And that allows me to delete three words. And again, those get put in my, in my paste buffer. So if I type P, I can paste them out again somewhere else. Um, so we've, um, let's see, what else is there? Uh, the other thing, the other movement that's probably um, interesting and will come up later in this talk is um, uh, the F key. So F will move you forward. Um, and F doesn't do anything on its own, but it will move you forward to any other character. So for instance, if I was on the beginning of this line and I know, okay, I wanna go add a parameter to this callback function, right? And I wanna get over here uh, to this like opening parenthesis of the function. Uh, to move my cursor straight there to that opening parenthesis, uh, I can type um, uh, F open parenthesis. And F open parenthesis there will move me forward to the first open parenthesis, which happens to be here after this get, right? I can move zero to go back to the beginning of the line. That wasn't quite what I wanted to do, right? I wanted to go, um, all the way to the second parenthesis. So one thing I could do is just do it twice, right? F open parenthesis to go to the first one, and then F open parenthesis again to go to the second one. Um, so that's one option. But from what we saw earlier, you might be able to guess that I can also just start adding numbers to this command to modify the movement, right? So in this case, the movement is go to the parenthesis, F parenthesis. If I say F2 parenthesis, oh, sorry. Oh no, it doesn't work that way, sorry. My bad. Um, there is, yeah, so I can say 2F open parenthesis and it'll move me to the second instance of that character on the line. So it'll move me to this second parenthesis. Um, and, um, and so that's useful for just moving the cursor around, but those commands become really powerful uh, when you combine them with things like delete and yank where you're grabbing code, right? So um, uh, one example would be, let's say that I have some function call, right? And I want to, um, uh, let's see, object dot some function call. So let's say I have this and I wanna like, I wanna change the, 
function I'm calling, let's say I've got a bunch of arguments in here, B, C, D. So let's say instead of, you know, object at some function call, I want to change the object and function that I'm calling, but I want to keep the arguments, right? I know that I can move to that first open parenthesis by saying F open parenthesis. Um, so if I want to change what I'm, uh, if I want to change everything up to that point, right, then I can say uh, D F open parenthesis, which will delete everything up to and including that <laughs> first open parenthesis. And then I can just hit I to go into insert mode and type something else, right? Uh, whatever the other method I wanted to call was. Um, and then escape will get me back to normal mode. So this stuff um, allows you to keep your hands on the keyboard. You're not always reaching over for the mouse to try and move your cursor somewhere else or highlight some text and delete it and change it. Um, um, so we've seen D and Y for deleting something, which is like cutting, because it puts it in your paste buffer, and Y, which is yanking or copying something. The other really handy uh, action that you can combine with all of these movements is C, and the C key will, um, will uh, it's like delete, and then it will delete all of the things um, in the movement that you specify. So in the range that you specify. So like DW will delete a word, CW will delete a word too, but the difference is that it will put you in insert mode directly afterwards. So we saw that you can type I to go into insert mode. Um, but in this case here, right, let's say I wanted to just change this method name and call a different method. I can say DW to delete the word and then I to go into insert mode and type new method, right? Um, but, what uh, C lets me do is I can say CW to just change that word and it deletes it for me, puts it in my paste buffer and then automatically puts me in insert mode. You can see down at the bottom of the screen here, I'm already in insert mode. Um, uh, and so I can change this to whatever I want it to be. Um, so, um, this combination of normal mode and insert mode allows normal mode to be dramatically more powerful because you have an entire keyboard at your disposal and you don't have to keep modifying, um, you don't have to keep modifying hotkeys and like shortcuts by putting a command or a control before all of them because it's just assumed that like, yeah, everything you're typing right now is some sort of a command. Um, so it allows you to do things like, uh, you know, change this word into another one uh, with just two keystrokes and do a lot of things with just one keystroke. Um, so that's, that's powerful. It's going to shave off a little bit of time once you get used to it. Um, it is helpful to keep your hands on the keyboard all the time. But I would say that if that's the only thing that um, working in an editor like VI got you, uh, I don't know that I would be sold on it. But what gets me excited is the things that that gets you. So what's interesting about what we've been doing is that everything, every way we've been interacting with the editor is very explicit, right? You could, you could sort of look at, um, you know, if you, if you installed a, um, like a keyboard listener, right, that just recorded all the keystrokes that you typed, you could play back an entire editing session, right, just from your keystrokes, and it would work exactly the same every time. All right, there's no, it's, it's not sort of, you, if, you, if you just watched like keyboard and mouse movement in another editor, it'd be hard to just look at that and see exactly what was going on in the program because you'd sort of have to know like, well, where was the window on the screen and what's the mouse doing? And it's a little more complicated. But in VI, all of your interactions with the editor is just a stream of characters that you typed um, that you could replay. And there are actually some really cool built-in commands you can use in VI to replay things that you've just done. Uh, and the, simple, the simplest one is the, is the period. So um, let's say, for instance, that um, uh, so in these lines here, type things in here. Say I wanted to change things to words, right? There's a lot of ways that I could do this, but one way is um, I could do, I could say CW, 
to erase things and put me in insert mode and then type words and hit escape. Um, and now uh, if I type the period key, what the period key is gonna do is it's gonna replay the last thing that I did, the last command that I executed. And in this case, the last command was CW and then WORDS escape, right? Um, so I can move my cursor somewhere else. And if I hit the period, it's gonna run that exact command again with the cursor in my current location allowing me to change there to words and into words and type to words. Um, and this type of thing uh, can, be, can be super useful when you're coding a lot of times. You're going and you wanna, you wanna change something, you wanna do something several times, um, you wanna repeat some sort of an action. Uh, this can be, can be extremely helpful. The spreadsheet of information. What? Video. Oh, yeah. She's just like, here's the email address. Just tell them you're for Learners Guild and we need it. I'm like, somebody got a question? The information so I can use it later. I think somebody was unmuted. Okay, cool. <laughs> so, um, um, doo -doo 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 -doo. period operator repeats things. Um, so, uh, right, and so the period can be used with. Uh, lots of different um, uh, commands, really any of the different commands, but it just repeats the last thing that you did. And that, that, can, become, that can become extremely powerful. Um, another example is um, a good use of this. So let's say that, um, uh, so right now the, the app we're looking at right here, oh, hang on. The app we're looking at right here is um, just an express app that uh, has one route where you type in someone's name and then slash color and it'll return their favorite color, provided that the name you supply is someone in my immediate family. Um, and uh, so let's say that, um, for example, I wanted to, uh, instead of just returning blue here, I wanted to change this to, uh, um, you know, favorite color, favorite color, colon, blue, right? Favorite, favorite color, blue, right? Um, so I want to do that, but now I'm going to have to do that on like each of these three lines, right? It's not a big deal, but it's a little bit of typing, and I'm a slow typer. Um, and that's not a joke, I am actually kind of a slow typer. So um, one thing we could do is um, uh, use the period operator, sort of automate this, right? So let's undo back before I wrote that, right? So if what I do here is come on the B, and I type I to go in insert mode, and then type fave, color, colon, space, escape, right? So now the last command I executed was that insert of fave color colon space. And I come down here for red and I can just hit period and it's gonna do it there. And I can put period on yellow and type period on the P. Um, and that's a lot faster than typing all that stuff out by hand. And as you've probably noticed by now, my spelling is not stellar. Um, so at least this time, I only have to spell it right once. Um, and I can just repeat it in all of those other places. Um, so the period operator is, is, is super handy. Use that all the time. Um, but it's, uh, it has its limitations, right? So let's say what I really wanted to do here was change this to say, um, uh, Trevor's favorite color is blue, right? Trevor's, whoa, I'm going to need one of those. Favorite color is blue. If that's the change I want to make, then I can't use the period operator down here because down here I want to do roughly the same thing. Um, but it needs to say Finn's favorite color is red, not Trevor's favorite color is red. Um, so the period operator is going gonna, is gonna to let us down a little bit. However, um, there is another option, uh, which is something called macros.
And a lot of editors have, have some version of macros, but macros in VR are really powerful for that, for that reason I mentioned earlier, that every, every interaction you have with your editor is just from typing a series of characters. So pretty much everything you do is very easily repeatable by the editor. And so I can actually type a series of commands and record all of them together in a block as a, as a macro and then replay them later. And the way that I start recording a macro is by typing Q. Um, so if I wanted to change uh, blue here to Trevor's color is blue in a repeatable way, what I would do is, um, uh, well, let me start with a simpler example here first. So, um, uh, so let me just start recording a macro just so we can see how that works, right? So if I hit Q um, and then another character, in this case, I'll just hit Q two times, it'll start um, recording a macro. And you can record, you, Q, the Q command records a macro and you have to specify another character, which is gonna be the name of that macro, right? So right now I'm recording a macro named Q. I usually name my macros Q so that I can just type Q two times to start recording. But if you wanted to record like and have several different macros saved at the same time, uh, you could use other characters. So down here it says it's recording Q, which means it's gonna record all the keystrokes that I type um, and all of those commands as a macro that can be played back later. So I'm gonna start by going into hey, insert mode. Trevor? Yeah, uh-huh. Would you be able to, um, in your terminal, can you bring the bottom up a little bit? Because I can't see what's on the bottom because- Oh yeah, thank you. Thanks for saying that. Is that better? Yeah, that's way better, thank you. Okay, yeah, thanks for mentioning that. Um, so, um, all right, so we're recording and now we're in insert mode and so I can type, um, uh, three words, word. Um, so I can type a three things and then escape. Maybe I get out of insert mode and then I can maybe go back a word and change this word to feet with a capital F and then move my cursor to the end of the line with the dollar sign. So all of those things um, have been recorded and I can type uh, Q again to stop the macro and we'll see that recording thing goes away. And then I can replay that macro um, somewhere else, let's say down here, um, by typing the at sign followed by the name of the macro. So in this case, we named our macro Q. So if I type at Q, um, it replays that same macro. And in this case, it looks a lot like just cutting and pasting, right? Like we type three words up here, we ended up with the same three words down here. It's not super interesting. But what's important to know is that we actually went through the steps of like insert all those first words originally and then move the cursor around and change one of them and then move the cursor back to the end of the line. Um, and that is powerful because if we want to do this thing down here where we change all these colors in this object to be, uh, you know, name's favorite color is colon space the color, uh, we can accomplish that with a macro, right? So I can say QQ, start recording. And the first thing I'm going to do is YW, which will yank the word that I'm in, right? So I'm, I'm at the T in Trevor, so I've just put the word Trevor in my buffer. And then I can use... Um, W to move my cursor forward until I get to the beginning of blue. Um, and then I can paste the word that I just copied, which happens to be Trevor. Um, and if I do a lowercase p, it will paste that word after my cursor. And if I do an uppercase p, it'll paste that word before my cursor. And in this case, I want it before blue and I'm already on the B in blue. So I'm gonna type uppercase p. Um, and then I'm gonna move over one character and hit I to go in insert mode. And then I can type the rest of this thing. Uh, Trevor's favorite color is blue. Um, and then I can get out of insert mode. And then the last thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move my cursor to the first character in this line. 
Um, so you see all this stuff is indented. What I want to do is I want to get back to this first um, uh, quote, just to kind of get back to where I started. Um, actually, I actually want to get back to the T because I started on that T in Trevor, right? And so I'm going to type um, shift six, which is that little carrot, carrot operator, which in a regular expression sort of references the beginning of a string, right? Um, if I type that, I'll get back to the first actual non white space character on the line. And then I can just move over one by pressing the right arrow. So now I've done everything I wanted. I've got my cursor back to where it started. And then I'm going to go down one and you'll see why in a second here. And then I'm going to stop my recording. So I've recorded all that stuff. I've changed the line that I've wanted to by first copying the word that I'm on and then adding it to the string and typing out everything else and then moving back to the beginning of the line and down. So now if I just replay that macro like we did earlier with at Q, um, it changes the fin line and it does it correctly, right? By yanking the word that you're under and then I can say at Q again and at Q again and change those other two lines. Um, so what I've kind of done is like I've written a little function, right? That macro is like a little function, right? That I can apply over and over again to different inputs where the different inputs are just based on where my cursor is, right? Um, and that's incredibly powerful. And this is something you'll find yourself doing a lot in code. And one of the things you'll notice in VI and honestly, any other good editor that you get really comfortable with is that you're not writing a lot of code. You're sending commands to your editor to tell your editor to write code. Um, but you spend less and less of your time just like doing data entry type coding where you're just typing lots of characters directly into the terminal, right? Um, this is especially true when you're doing like refactoring or changing existing code. A lot of times when you're coding, you're, you're moving things around, you're renaming things, you're shuffling things around. <coughs> um, and it can save you a lot of time to be able to sort of automate things like this. Um, another really good example of this is these like const expressions up here, right? Um, so uh, this is the, you know, the require method of, of requiring modules, but in ES 2016, you can say this instead, right? Import FS from FS. Um, and a lot of times I'll get in a situation where, you know, I'm, I'm upgrading a module, right? Like, okay, we were doing all the imports this way, but we wanna use this new syntax that's now available because it's a little cleaner. I'm gonna standardize on that. Um, so I can come in here and like rewrite all of these things, but it's messy, right? And it's tough to do a search and replace that will do this exactly the way I want it to um, because I need to like maintain these like the FS, you know, and the express. And so again, I can just use a macro for this. And the nice thing is there's not a lot of like extra setup. I type two characters, QQ to start recording. And then I just do whatever it is I would have done to edit this line in the first place. And as long as I make sure my cursor ends up in the right place, I have a macro that's gonna be really easy to replace, right? So how would I change this? First, I need to do CW to change const to import. And then I need to go forward to the equal sign because that needs to be changed to from. And then I need to get rid of this require in the parentheses, right? So I'm just gonna move over here and I'm gonna say delete forward DF to the open parenthesis to get rid of all that stuff. And then I'm gonna use dollar sign to go to the end of the line and X to delete that parenthesis. And then zero will get back to the beginning of the line. Down arrow will move me down to the next require statement and I can stop recording. And then I can just do all these other ones in like four characters. Um, so, and this, this is the thing, this is why I can't stop using VI. <laughs> I will see other editors that have really cool features. There's a lot of really good other editors out there. Um, but I have not found this, this, this type of like ease of use macros, uh, macros that are this easy to use and this powerful. I haven't quite found in other editors, primarily because a lot of the things you do in other editors require you to drill through menus and use your mouse. And it's just a lot harder to create a macro that replays that type of behavior. Um, so, um, right, that's macros. So the other thing I wanted to talk about while there's still time is terminal integration. Um, so VI being a command that's being run in the terminal is really tightly integrated with the terminal. Um, 
and there's a there's a lot of um, a lot of different ways you can integrate with the terminal. Um, the simplest is if you if you need a quick if you need, you know to quickly get a terminal to run some command, it's really easy to do that from VI because you're already in your terminal. You're already in your terminal emulator. You're in iTerm or term terminal or whatever, and you're just running some app. And so you can use um, the terminal's built-in ability to suspend a running program and then bring it back um, to sort of hop out of VI real quickly to run some command in the terminal and then come back into the editor. So I can use Control Z. Um, some of you may have seen this, some of you may have not, but Control Z is sort of like Control C, right? Control C will send a kill signal to the current process and Control Z will just sleep the current process and, um, and get you back to your terminal. So if I hit Control Z, I'll see this thing says ZHH, you know, suspended Vim. Um, and now I'm at a terminal again and I can run some command like, okay, what was in my current directory? And then I can use the FG command in the terminal to bring the most recently suspended process back to the foreground. Um, and boom, I'm back, I'm back in VI. So you'll see me run tests like that a lot. VI actually has uh, another way to interact with the terminal um, using um, the, the, v, the VI command line. So in VI, one of the things you can do in normal mode is type colon. And when you type colon, colon will open up a little kind of command prompt down at the bottom of the window. And this, by the way, in case you were wondering, is how you quit VI, right? So one of the commands that you can type is just Q. Colon Q um, will quit VI. But if you have unsaved changes, you'll get this warning saying, no write since last changed. Um, so if you want to save and then quit, um, you can do colon WQ. So W for write and Q for quit. So it'll write the file, save the file, and then quit. Um, so if you've learned nothing else from this lecture, you now know how to exit them. Uh, but let's get back in there and look at some other things you can do with the colon. And one of these, one of the things you can do here is you can run a command from within VI. So I can type colon exclamation point, and then any, any terminal command after this, and VI will run it for me, show me the output, and then let me get back to the editor. So I can do that ls-l from right here within VI, and it will you know, show me the output, and then let me press enter to get right back into the editor. So that's also really handy for things like NPM test, right? You wanna run your tests. Um, you can just type colon bang NPM test um, to run your tests. I don't know if I have a package file set up here. Yeah, I don't have a package file set up to run tests, but it, it tried. Um, and the other cool thing about the colon is that once you type colon, it's, it's, um, you can use the up arrow to search back in your history of other commands that you've executed. So I can type colon up arrow and bring back up that last command. So this is really helpful when you're like running tests over and over. Um, you can do some editing in your file and then just colon bang up arrow and it'll um, run your test command again. <coughs> um, so if you get comfortable with the terminal, this brings a lot of the power of the terminal right into your editor. Um, you know, I can do things like, um, do, do, uh, you know, run git commands from right in my editor, git status, right? What's the status of my current deal? Um, you can check in code right from your editor, right? You could do a git commit. And this is starting to get in the way. I'm going to turn this off for a second. Uh, you know, you get commit directly from inside your editor. And all this stuff is you didn't have to install some like crazy git plugin, right? Vim just has a built-in command line. And then you can use all those command line tools that you use like git, for instance. Um, you can also do things like, um, so one of the commands that you can issue from the colon is E, which will open a new file for editing. So let me open like an index.html. Um, this is something I actually do quite a lot of or have been doing a lot of lately. Uh, you get into a HTML file. Like for the challenges um, uh, for the phase interview, there's some HTML you have to build. So I'll be reading through an HTML file. I want to see it in a browser. 
um, you know, OS X has that built-in command open that will open a file in the appropriate uh, application. So I can just say colon bang open. Oh, let's see, let's write this file first. So index.html colon bang open index.html. And Vim will tab complete things here just like it will in the in the shell, which is super handy. So I can do that, and that will, you know, <clears throat> run the open command in my terminal, which opens that file that I was looking at in my browser. Um, uh, so that that's sort of the second way you can integrate with the terminal in VI. And the third way, uh, which is probably my favorite, is that you can um, you can uh, run terminal commands from within VI and send to them portions of the current file as standard input to have them operate on it. So um, for instance, uh, I've got these uh, import commands at the front of my file. A lot of times your import commands at the beginning of your file, they just get really long. There's lots and lots of them. You're pulling in a lot of modules. Um, and a common, a common uh, practice is to sort them alphabetically, right? So there's at least some structure, there's some reason to like the order that things are imported. So if I wanted to sort these alphabetically, I could do it manually, um, which would be a little annoying. I'm gonna move these lines around. But I know that there is a terminal command. Uh, I'm gonna come back up to the terminal here real quick. There's a kernel command called sort that takes uh, some input, uh, FFF, um, and then sorts it. So this is where I, this is what I typed, and then the output here is in alphabetical order. So that's super handy, right? So I could do like an ls l um, and pipe that to sort, and it'll come back sorted. Um, <clears throat> so um, so that's really handy, right? That's a built-in shell command that's available in any sort of Unix-like architecture. Um, uh, it would be really neat if I could just send that sort command these lines and have it sort them, right? And it turns out that I can. Um, and the easiest way to do this is using um, something called visual mode. So we've seen normal mode where we're typing commands. We've seen insert mode where we're inserting things. There's one more mode in VI called visual mode. And if I type V, we'll see down here, instead of insert, it says visual. Um, and as I move my cursor around with the arrows, um, let me turn this back on so y'all can see what's going on. Uh, you can see that I'm highlighting code, right? Not super fancy. But once I have it highlighted, one of the things I can do is um, type an exclamation point. And we'll see down at the bottom of the screen, we have this colon command that's started that has this weird like notation and then an exclamation point. This notation, the quote less than colon quote greater than is just Vim's way of specifying this range of code that I've highlighted. And then there's an exclamation point and now I can type any shell command and VI will send as input to that shell command whatever I have highlighted and then it will replace the highlighted section in my file with whatever the output of that command is. So if I pipe that to sort, um, I've just sorted my import statements um, without having to do any alphabetizing myself. Um, so that's another really handy feature. And what this opens up for you is the ability to write any program you want that takes something as standard input and modifies it and returns it in standard output. Um, and um, uh, use that as like an extension to your, to your own uh, editor. So for instance, I have a, um, let's see, I have a, a Ruby script that I've written called uh, a line. Make sure I know where this is. It's in my bin directory and there's this, I have this align script, which I'll open up for you here. Um, and it's Ruby, and basically what it does is it tries to align, um, uh, I use it to align objects like this, so that I want all these colons to line up, right? So I kind of like often when I'm writing code to line up uh, colons and these 
commas um, so that the code's a little more readable, right? But it's a pain to have to do that manually. It's almost not worth it if you have to do it manually. But that actually turns out to be a really easy thing to write a script that can take text in that looks like this and just add spaces in the right place so the colons all line up. Um, and once I've written that script, I can then do the same visual mode thing, exclamation point, and then just pass this to my bin align um, script. Oh, it's been a while since I've done this. I think I have to pass it the character that I want to align. Nope. Mm -hmm. And then first lines. How does this thing work? Do, do, do. Sorry, it's been a while since I've used that one. I'm going to move on to a different example as I forget exactly what the command line arms for that arm. Um, but you can imagine how you could use other uh, command line applications for this as well, right? Like grep is a good one here. So for instance, if I said, you know what, I've got all these things in my object. I really only want, um, uh, let's see, let's change Anna's favorite color to blue. Uh, and I said, you know what, I only want to use, I only want to show in here people whose favorite color is blue. I could select all this and then grab blue and filter out all lines that don't have the word blue in them um, really quickly. Um, Excuse me, Trevor. Yeah, huh? Um, how do you, like, I see that you have, like, the coloration of your text here. Like, mm -hmm. is that a package that you install? Like, how do you, um, how do you kind of modify your Vim to be able to show these, like, colorful text? That is an excellent question. Um, so, um, yeah, so Vim has built-in syntax highlighting, but, um, you have to install um, packages for different languages so it knows how to, how to um, highlight different languages. And so, um, and sometimes it's also just a matter of, like there's some built in, you just have to turn it on. And that's the other sort of intimidating thing about VI, I guess, is that um, there's a little bit of configuration you wanna do out of the box to make it um, more friendly and get this sort of coloration. Um, and all of that's done in a file. Let's go to uh, culture vim rc. So sort of like you have a uh, you know dot git ignore file um, in a lot of your uh, in your git repository. That sort of is like configuration for git um, or a git config file in your home directory. For VI, uh, if you look in your home directory, you can create a .vimrc file, kind of like your bash rc, right? But it's for vim. Um, my vimrc file is large. It's sort of grown over the years. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on in here. But one of the things that we'll find in here is uh, a section on syntax highlighting. And one of the things I have in here is just syn on, which just turns syntax highlighting on. And I think that will get you syntax highlighting for some uh, more common file types and programming languages. Um, and then if you're looking to, um, do, let's see if I have, I don't, I have a lot of stuff going on in here. If you're looking for syntax highlighting for a specific language like JavaScript, right? Um, Uh, then, um, you can look for packages. Honestly, I don't think I had to install anything to get JavaScript syntax highlighting. I think you just have to turn syntax highlighting on in uh, your Vimrc file and you should get some decent JavaScript syntax highlighting. Um, but there are other packages out there that you can install um, like this one uh, that may try and provide like, you know, improved syntax highlighting from what the default is. There's a lot of different ways you can, you know, do syntax highlighting for a given language. So there, there might be competing packages out there for your language of choice. Um, so you may have to Google that, but the short answer is turn syntax highlighting on in your, your VimRC. And then um, if you're not pleased with the, 
the syntax hiring you get from that, you might want to install like a, a plugin that um, gives you more stuff. And I've got, if you look at my Vim RC, um, the other nice thing about Vim is that it is extensible. It's, you can write um, extensions for it. Like you can in a lot of different editors that um, do a lot of things. And I have a lot of these installed. And when I install them, I, I put comments in my Vim RC. So I remember <laughs> what it is I've installed and what I'm using in case I need to get to it again. Um, but there's a lot of very powerful um, plugins. Vim sort of has its own programming language uh, that you write your VimRC in where you can actually like write functions that you could call from within your Vim script. So you can, um, you can do a lot of customization or download packages that have done a lot of customization for you. Um, so for instance, Vim, Vim JSON is something that I've installed that gives me syntax highlighting for JSON. Um, um, yeah, and I can share a link to my MRC uh, if you want. Yeah, did you have to write it from scratch? Um, you know, it's a combination of like copying things from other people, um, writing parts of it from scratch. This, this VimRC represents like 10 years of development in VI. So there's a lot of stuff in here that I've just like added over time. Like, oh, I'm going to use this thing. Um, uh, a lot of this is like configuring specific plugins that I have. Um, uh, so you can kind of install plugins and then add things to your VimRC that like turn on or off different options. Um, some of this stuff I don't use anymore and I could probably delete, but it's like, you know, I've got a bunch of settings in here for um, specific uh, stuff that was specific to when I was doing a lot of Ruby editing. So you'll see a lot of in here, like commands in here specifically to be executed when I open a Ruby file to do different things. Um, yeah, never delete it. It's a museum now. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's version controlled and, you know, I, I keep stuff around in case I ever need to come back to it. Um, but um, uh, we are running a little bit over and I apologize for that. But I wanted to make a couple of points uh, at the end of this, which is, uh, you know, if, if this has not convinced you to use Vim, and it very well may not have, uh, what you should walk away from here is the idea that um, you should be doing more with your editor than just data entry. If your primary, if your primary interaction with your editor is just like typing out your code character by character, um, you're missing out on a lot of the editors that you, a lot of your editor's features. Um, and if your editor doesn't have much more to offer you than just data entry, then you should probably look at a, a more advanced editor. Um, but you should expect your editor to have like really tight terminal integration. You should not have to uh, move to a s like switch programs to go over to your terminal to run your tests, for instance. Most editors worth their salt are going to have a way that you can in one or two characters run your test suite. Um, good ones will give you a way to run the tests just for the specific file that you're editing. Um, and so you should, you should, you should look into that, like to where you can have, um, you know, how it is you can do tighter terminal integration with your editor so that like things like running your tests is very easy or just like running an ad hoc command in your shell you can do from within your editor. Most editors have something like that. Um, mouseless editing is another one. So um, in most good editors, you can do pretty much everything you need to do without reaching for your mouse. Um, and if you can learn those shortcuts and learn those uh, features, it will just speed up the, the, the pace at which you can um, write code. It'll make simpler things easy for you, um, which just gives you more time to think about the, the problem that you're solving with your code, which is where you really want to be sending most of your mental energy is on like the conceptual problem of your code, not the like, oh, and now I need to like move this text over here. And again, it's, it's you know, less focus on data entry, more focus on like problem solving. Um, and uh, this third one, what I call metaprogramming, um, it's not actually the definition you'll find for metaprogramming in most places, but the idea here just being that like you're telling your editor, you're giving your editor commands so that it can write your code for you. You're sort of like programming your editor so that it can write your code, um, uh, which is something that VI gives you with like those macros or uh, the, the dot command to sort of repeat things. Um, and a lot of good editors will have some sort of macro functionality or um, 
really powerful search and replace. Uh, so some editors will, will have search and replace functionality that's powerful enough to do those sort of replacements that I was using macros to do in, in VI. Um, so you want to look into those. Anytime you, you're typing something repeatedly in your editor, like, oh, I need to change this function name everywhere in three files. Like if there's not some really easy automated way to do that in your editor, find another editor um, or, you know, figure out how it is that your editor is going to make that easy for you. Don't do that work by hand. Um, it's just not worth your, your, your time and your brain power is too valuable. And there, there are tools out there for that. Um, and then extensibility. Most editors, you know, good development environment editors will have a way to install plugins um, so that you can sort of source a community of like customizations. I know this is going to be true for things like Atom and Sublime, um, probably the editors that you're using. Um, so you want, you want that in an editor and then spend some time. It's worth spending some time researching, like what are the really good extensions or plugins for my editor for JavaScript, for the language I'm using? Do some research and see what's out there because um, you'll probably find some pretty awesome stuff that will, will save you time um, and make you more happy. Because uh, that's the other thing about this. It's not just saving time. It's like you want to spend time doing the thing that you're most interested in. And probably like shuffling text around is not the reason that you – uh, got into programming, right? Um, so you want to spend more of your mental energy doing the stuff that's fun and exciting um, and less of it um, doing data entry and just typing. So that's my pitch. Know, know thine editor. Oh, that was so awesome. Trevor, thank you so much. Um, for anyone that's watching this or is going to watch this in the future, I definitely got into Vim by playing this really rad game online called VimAdventures.com. Uh, that I recommend for anyone because it, I'll put the link in this um, chat, uh, because it's, it's kind of a cool way that teaches you all of the shortcuts and like you can only progress into further levels as you kind of gain new shortcuts. So it gives you a really good amount of time to, um, to kind of get familiar with the shortcut before you move on. So it's, it's not just like, hey, here's a thousand shortcuts, go for it. It's like get familiar in this level with this handful of shortcuts and then you can move on to the next. So. Um, yeah, I highly recommend it if, if you want to kind of get familiar with the keystrokes. Mm -hmm. Great. Great recommendation. Thank you. No worries. Thank you so much. All right. Um, and since we're over time, I'm probably not going to pause for questions here, but certainly hit me up in Slack if you're interested in anything uh, or need a hand with that. I will be around. Thanks, everybody.